Welcome to the University of Kentucky's Department of Anesthesiology YouTube channel. This is part of our high yield keyword review on the topics respiratory anatomy, physiology, and thoracic anesthesia. It's video cast number five of a five part series and we'll continue right on into our uh, keywords. And the first one will be pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension by definition is a mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 25 millimeters of mercury at rest. Pulmonary vascular resistance can be calculated uh, by knowing the mean pulmonary artery pressure, subtracting the wedge pressure, dividing it by the cardiac output, and times it by 80 to put it into the proper units. So a resistance is equal to a change in pressure over a flow, and pulmonary vascular resistance can often be increased in patients with pulmonary hypertension. The etiology of having the pressures up in the pulmonary system can be either the heart, the lung, or some other reason, but the heart and the lung are the top two. Left heart failure, fluid backing up into the pulmonary system, raising the pressures in the pulmonary system, eventually potentially causing right heart failure. COPD, where you have destruction of alveolar capillary units. Um, those are the two top causes of pulmonary hypertension, but things like obesity hypoventilation syndrome, congenital heart disease, and some idiopathic causes. Sometimes young teenagers in, in early 20s can have pulmonary arterial hypertension and uh, very devastating disease. Diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, electrocardiogram, you can see P pulmonale or peak P waves in lead two greater than three millimeters, right ventricular hypertrophy, right bundle branch block, on echocardiography, enlargement of the right atrium, the right ventricle, RV dilation, and a tricuspid regurgitant jet that is under high velocity. Now, if your pressures are up in the pulmonary system, it's your right heart that pays the price because it's beating against that high resistance, and that's why you get chamber enlargement on the right side. And if you get chamber enlargement, it can pull apart the tricuspid annulus, and if the pressure is high in the right ventricle during systole, blood goes backwards through that tricuspid valve, and you get a high velocity tricuspid regurgitant jet. And as the graphic at the top right shows, if you put a Doppler across the tricuspid regurgitant jet and measure its velocity, there is a correlation between its velocity and pressure. And in fact, this is how estimates of RV systolic pressure are done on transthoracic and TEE. Four times the velocity squared of that tricuspid regurgitant jet plus the CVP, whether it's estimated or measured, gives you an estimate of RV systolic pressure. And when that's over about 40, we say, hmm, that's a problem. But the gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary hypertension is putting a catheter into the right side of the heart and measuring the pressures in the pulmonary artery. Treatment for pulmonary hypertension is oxygen and vasodilators, sometimes calcium channel blockers and phosphodesterase inhibitors. Sildenafil is a, uh, a PDE5 inhibitor and often used for erectile dysfunction, but it can be used for uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension. And if someone's taken sildenafil, it's recommended that they avoid concomitant nitroglycerin use because of the potential for severe uh, hypotension if they're used together. If someone's on sildenafil for management of pulmonary hypertension, before surgery, don't stop it. It should be continued. If it's used for erectile dysfunction, it's best that they not be taking it um, uh, probably a day or so before surgery because it has a half-life of about four to five hours. And other drugs that they may be on, inhaled nitric oxide, not too common, more to use for a really severe pulmonary hypertensive episodes after heart surgery, lung transplantation, heart transplantation, occasionally on intravenous uh, medicines, uh, continuously through PICC lines to decrease their pulmonary blood pressure. Things to avoid so in someone who has pulmonary hypertension, Avoid the things that would increase pulmonary vascular resistance. High CO2, low oxygen, acidosis, being cold, sympathetic stimulation with a rise in norepinephrine levels can all increase pulmonary vascular resistance. From an anesthetic side, ketamine, nitrous oxide, also both of those have been shown to increase pulmonary vascular resistance, so avoid those in general. And spinal anesthesia, probably not the greatest idea in someone with severe pulmonary hypertension, because of the sudden drop in preload and afterload that can occur 
Pulmonary aspiration is the next keyword. The risk of aspiration pneumonitis goes up as the pH of the fluid in the stomach or aspirant goes down and as the volume goes up. So if the pH is less than two to two and a half and the volume of the gastric fluid is high, the chance of having a full-blown uh, Mendelssohn syndrome or aspiration pneumonitis goes up. Classically, it's that pH of two to two and a half or less, and classically the volume was approximately 0.4 mils per kilogram, although there's debate about uh, the volume that's associated with pneumonitis. Most importantly is the pH, because as you can imagine, if you aspirated blood with a normal pH, you could aspirate a lot of blood in the lung without causing a, a pneumonitis of the classic variant of risk uh, of pulmonary aspiration pneumonitis. If someone regurgitates and uh, is likely aspirating, putting their head in the lateral position, suctioning their pharynx, Trendelenburg position, putting an endotracheal tube in, suctioning the endotracheal tube if they had a laryngeal mask airway, uh, potentially pulling the laryngeal mask, suctioning, then pulling the laryngeal mask airway, putting an endotracheal tube down, giving positive pressure ventilation with PEEP, don't put saline or bicarbonate solutions into the airway, it can worsen the pneumonitis. Uh, there is no recommendation to actually check the pH of the endotracheal tube secretions in an attempt to determine uh, what the risk of uh, full-blown pneumonitis is in someone who has aspirated. If there's large food particles or other particles in the airway, bronchoscopy may be indicated to remove them. No prophylactic antibiotics unless there's evidence of secondary infection develops and don't give steroids, they're not useful and follow the patient up with white blood cell counts, chest x-rays, often the right lower lobe is the one that will show up first with uh, symptoms of, um, or signs of aspiration, and follow arterial blood gases. So volume and pH, the important thing with pulmonary aspiration. The next key word is transfusion-related acute lung injury, or trolley, and the risk factors for it, which was a 2019 IT keyword. Trolley is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema that occurs within six hours after transfusion of red cells, platelets, and FFP. So it's not just red cells that can cause trolley. Platelets and FFP also and may actually be worse risk. The x-ray looks like on the far right both lungs are involved, a whiteout consistent with acute lung injury within six hours of uh, a transfusion. The non-cardiogenic refers to this is not a problem with the left side of the heart, so left atrial uh, pressures are not high, the wedge pressure is not high, uh, you don't have a left heart that's failing, causing uh, fluid in the lungs. This is a problem with leaky alveolar membranes and occurs in about one out of 4,500 transfusions and it is a reaction between antibodies and white blood cells with degranulation of white blood cells on the pulmonary endothelium. Now the antibodies can come from the uh, patient that's receiving the transfusion or from the person that gave the transfusion. The white blood cells can come from either uh, also. But in general, it is an antibody binding to a white blood cell, activating those white blood cells. They release their stuff from inside the white blood cell, which damages the pulmonary endothelium, that degranulation, and then there's leaky membranes that occur causing that white out of both lungs within six hours after a transfusion. So if white blood cells are involved in this pathophysiologically, removing them may decrease the presence of uh, anti-leukocyte antibodies and white blood cell reduction is usually done uh, in many uh, transfusion centers. Multiparous women or multiply transfused donors should not be used as plasma donors because their serum may have high titers of these leukoagglutinating antibodies and increase the risk of trolley. The next keyword is mediastinoscopy. Some potential complications at the far right shows a uh, mediastinoscope in blue sitting in front of the trachea and behind the uh, aorta and you can see where it is right behind the innominate artery. And as the mediastinoscope is, is placed it is usually used to access uh, lymph nodes, carinal, paratracheal, and if it's sitting there between the trachea and the aorta and the innominate artery became pinched between it and the sternum, for example, you could see how blood flow could be reduced or totally cut off uh, 
to the right common carotid artery and to the right subclavian artery, and the pulse on the right side would go away. So we tend to monitor the blood pressure in the right upper extremity for this compression of the innominate. If the scope tore the pleura, you could get a pneumothorax, hemorrhage, um, oftentimes down the scope when they see something that looks like a lymph node they'll place a needle and aspirate from what they think is a lymph node to make sure that it's not a blood vessel before they take a forceps and uh, rip off part of that lymph node. Uh, obviously if it was the pulmonary artery for example and they put the forceps down and ripped it you'd have massive transfusion needs as uh, bleeding into the chest would occur and often require the initiation of cardiopulmonary bypass. So hemorrhage is a risk. Erroneous diagnosis of cardiac arrest, well, if you compress the innominate artery, there's no pulse on the right side. Uh, uh, this could be diagnosed as cardiac arrest if you didn't see a pulse on that right side. However, you should still have end tidal CO2. You should still hear a heart beating, uh, et cetera. Bradycardia can occur because the vagus nerve is right near there, and if you stretch it with the scope, you can get a reflex bradycardia. The next key word is apneic oxygenization. And this may be used uh, for bronchoscopy and microlaryngoscopy, like an ENT surgery, to provide a quiet surgical field for procedures such as laser resection of airway tumors. In general, this is uh, a anesthetized patient that's relaxed. Oxygen is in insufflated, oftentimes via a small catheter placed just above the carina after they've been denitrogenated and oxygenated with 100% oxygen. And Basically, there's a long period where just oxygen is being insufflated, but they're not being ventilated. And you can actually do this for an extended period of time, that is, maintain oxygenization, uh, but CO2 builds up. And in general, the apneic period is not allowed to extend more than about five minutes because CO2 builds up at a rate of, on average, about six millimeters of mercury the first minute and about three to four millimeters of mercury for each subsequent minute of apnea and eventually as it rises can cause cardiac arrhythmias and other problems. So apneic oxygenization, you can oxygenate for an extended period of time, but hypercarbia frequently ensues. Carbon monoxide is the next key word. Smoke inhalation uh, from a fire, someone's pulled out of a fire, incomplete combustion, someone is in a house where their heater's malfunctioning, or in a garage where an auto is running, uh, desflurane in the presence of a dry CO2 absorber can form carbon monoxide. All those are sources of carbon monoxide. The oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is shifted to the left uh, by carbon monoxide, and that means that it does not deliver oxygen well to the tissues. Patients who have uh, carbon monoxide poisoning often have headache and nausea, restlessness, confusion, CNS symptoms, and if you uh, look at an SpO2 pulse oximeter monitor, um, you're not going to make the diagnosis because the pulse oximeter will merely go along uh, overestimating the actual SaO2, that is oxyhemoglobin, because carboxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin absorb very similarly. But you should draw a blood gas and send it off to the cooximeter. Uh, in the cooximeter, will determine how much of the hemoglobin has oxygen bound to it, or is oxyhemoglobin, and how much is carboxyhemoglobin. And greater than 20% is considered uh, uh, toxicity. There are patients who smoke heavily that can have carboxy levels, for example, five, seven, eight, nine percent I've seen. Um, minute ventilation is typically unchanged in these patients who have carbon monoxide poisoning. They don't hyperventilate. And you have to think about that for a moment. Hypoxia is supposed to make you hyperventilate, right? The carotid body senses PaO2. But the problem here is a problem with oxygen content. You have carbon monoxide bound to hemoglobin. It's not necessarily PaO2. And so um, since the carotid body responds to changes in PO2, not oxygen content, um, you often will not see a patient hyperventilating in response to carbon monoxide toxicity. The treatment, if it's really bad, is hyperbaric oxygen, but 100% FiO2 giving them oxygen, uh, putting them not only in 100% oxygen, but under several atmospheres, usually about three atmospheres of pressure in HBO therapy. And specifically, those that we put in HBO therapy would be the really high risk ones that have high levels of carboxyhemoglobin, like greater than 40%,
those that are pregnant with uh, carboxyhemoglobin levels greater than 15%, uh, patients having chest pain with carbon monoxide poisoning. You can even transfuse packed red blood cells to provide oxygenization, but usually HPO therapy, supplemental oxygen are the management. Let's talk about hyperbaric oxygen next, some of the indications, carbon monoxide poisoning, especially in the pregnant patient or a patient with cardiovascular disease or CNS dysfunction. Air embolization, a venous air embolism or cardiopulmonary bypass accidents where air went to the head, you can put them under hyperbaric oxygen. Cyanide poisoning, where cyanide poisons oxygen use by the tissues. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen may provide temporization while you administer thiosulfate, B12, and amyl nitrate or other medicines to treat the cyanide poisoning. Gas gangrene infections that are gas producing, uh, especially anaerobic bacteria, give them more oxygen and you can help get rid of those bacteria. Uh, people who have uh, scuba dove, for example, or decompression sickness from other reasons, but scuba diving would be one of those where they ascended rapidly and had uh, nitrogen uh, embolization. Uh, and uh, hyperbaric oxygen would be indicated. Exceptional anemia. Occasionally, the patient, like a Jehovah's Witness, a patient who refuses blood transfusion, has a very low hemoglobin, may be put into a hyperbaric chamber for a period of time uh, as temporization. Central retinal artery occlusion is another one. But at the top of the list is carbon monoxide poisoning, decompression sickness. Some of the complications of hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, is the next key word. And there was a gap in knowledge from several years ago about HBO and complications. If a patient is in an HBO chamber and develops a generalized seizure during the therapy, the most appropriate initial treatment is to just discontinue the inhaled oxygen. This is oxygen toxicity, which is what was being described in the question. Uh, HBO-related uh, seizures reduce the inspired PO2. You don't need to decompress the chamber. Um, rarely is there any sequela to these HBO seizures and they can have HBO therapy again and it doesn't appear to be more common to have seizures in the HBO chamber in patients with seizure disorders. It's the high levels of oxygen somehow irritate the CNS, seizures can occur, just reduce the oxygen. You do not need to give them usually any type of benzodiazepine or other drug to stop the seizure. Oxygen toxicity in general, if you just give someone 100% oxygen for about 10 to 12 hours, they start to get tracheobronchial irritation, they coughing and a chest pain, a burning chest pain, and that's from oxygen irritation of that airway. That's a form of oxygen toxicity, and they can get an ARDS-like pulmonary symptoms. CNS, nausea, vomiting, uh, uh, seizures, as we previously described, and then in the eyes, narrowing of the visual fields and a change in refraction, they just can't see very well. So the lungs, the brain, and the eyes are the target of HBO oxygen toxicity and complications. The next topic, keyword, is pulmonary embolization. The number one symptom of a pulmonary embolism is acute dyspnea, and the number one sign is tachypnea and tachycardia. Um, oftentimes, the uh, ABG uh, will be normal or show a decreased PaO2 and a decreased PaCO2. The EKG may show ST segment changes and right-sided heart changes because the pulmonary embolism is blocking the pulmonary artery and the right heart half is having to beat against that obstruction, right axis deviation, peak P waves, which is P pulmonale, right bundle branch block, atrial fibrillation. If a PE occurs during anesthesia, Often it's recognized by a drop in saturation, a drop in blood pressure, patients getting tachycardic, occasionally bronchospasm, and one classic one is decreased end tidal CO2 because there's increased dead space. That is, as the embolus goes out into the pulmonary artery or segments of the pulmonary artery, it blocks blood flow to those segments which continue to be ventilated. So they're ventilated but not perfused, which is dead space. And so end tidal CO2 going along at 35, suddenly dropping to 15 uh, during uh, hip surgery, I would worry, especially during reaming, that there had been an embolization that occurred, possibly a marrow. And then CVP may go up, why? Because if there's obstruction to RV outflow track in the pulmonary artery, the right ventricle has to beat against that obstruction, the pressure in the right heart goes up. Diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, there is a blood test that could be helpful, D-dimer, which shows evidence of fibrinolysis occurring, 
CT, pulmonary angiography are, uh, are um, imaging exams. Bronchopleural fistula, ventilatory management is the next key word. A bronchopleural fistula is an abnormal communication between the bronchial tree and the pleural cavity and occasionally it goes all the way out through the pleural cavity, out through the skin, out into uh, the air. So that's occasionally cutaneous all the way from the bronchus out into uh, the air. Anesthetic management, the problem is, is that one, you want to protect the lung that doesn't have the bronchial pleural fistula from contamination of whatever's in that side, such as infected um, uh, pus and blood and other things. Um, you want to, you worry that is, about tension pneumothorax with positive pressure ventilation. So if a patient has that developed, that bronchial pleural fistula, and you put a tube down their trachea and started to ventilate them, air is going to go in the lowest resistance circuit, which may be down that uh, lung with the bronchial pleural fistula, out that low resistance into the pleura, and if it goes into the pleura, it could cause a tension pneumothorax. And inadequate ventilation can occur, because again, if you're ventilating that person and it goes out uh, the lowest resistance pathway, it's not going to go into the good lung and it just leaks out the fistula and your inspired tidal volume uh, is greater than your expired tidal volume if you're measuring both. So isolation of the affected side uh, to prevent contamination and allow adequacy of ventilation. The gold standard is an awake intubation, double lumen tube, spontaneous ventilation, but uh, just remember that um, if you positive pressurely ventilate a bronchial pleural fistula that is not communicating through the cutaneous uh, tissue out into the air, where does it go? It's going to go into the pleura and tension pneumothorax can occur. Ventilatory management, double lumen tube with differential lung ventilation, keeping the tidal volume and airway pressures low to the affected lung, uh, and high frequency jet ventilation uh, for really large bronchial pleural fistulas. The next key word is capnothorax, which is instead of pneumothorax, it's CO2 in the pleural space. This was a key word uh, from 2019. Capnothorax, pneumothorax with carbon dioxide. It is a potential complication of laparoscopy, abdominal laparoscopy, where CO2 is being insufflated in the abdomen. It can go up through uh, openings in the diaphragm into the chest and um, uh, cause this capnothorax. Actually during a VATS procedure, video assisted thoracic uh, procedure, CO2 is sometimes insufflated just to compress that lung, so that's an intentional uh, capnothorax during VATS. Well, what happens if you get a capnothorax, for example during laparoscopy? The saturation often drops, the airway pressures often go up, and end tidal CO2 tends to rise. Now you can differentiate this capnothorax from an air pneumothorax by, in the case of an air pneumothorax, end tidal CO2 drops. So with all the CO2 in the uh, pleural space with a capnothorax, you get an increase in end tidal CO2. With an air pneumothorax, a decreased end tidal CO2. And differentiating it from CO2 gas embolization, for example, if the laparoscope uh, was insufflating carbon dioxide into open veins, um, if it's very large, you can have obstruction to venous return if that big gas embolism is huge, blood pressure, cardiac output decrease, and also end tidal CO2 tends to decrease. Treatment of a capnothorax, if it's unstable, the patient's blood pressure is down, you know, stop the insufflation of carbon dioxide in the abdomen, deflate the abdomen, and CO2 resolves usually pretty quickly. Rarely does a chest tube need to be placed in a capnothorax. In fact, that's one of the take-home points is CO2 will absorb and resolve with conservative management in most cases and no chest tube is needed. Now if they're uh, a stable, you can just decrease the insufflation pressure in the abdomen, continue and monitor lung ultrasound uh, support would be, what would I see if they had a capnothorax? Well, if you put your lung ultrasound on the side of the capnothorax, lung sliding would be absent, uh, and a seashore sign and presence of lung point uh, might be there. So absence of lung slide could be present in a capnothorax. The next keyword is ventilator-associated pneumonia. 
This is something we often worry about in the intensive care unit where someone is intubated and mechanically ventilated for a period of time. As time goes on, there's an increased risk of nosocomial pneumonia or ventilator-associated pneumonia. The early onset of ventilator-associated pneumonia tends to be bacteria like strep and staph. Um, late onset tends to be weirder bugs like Pseudomonas and Acinobacter. Um, four days of mechanical ventilation and developing a pneumonia qualifies as ventilator-associated event. You can diagnose it with bacteria in a bronchoalveolar cells or do uh, a BAL, bronchoalveolar lavage, and get bronchial growth exceeding certain thresholds. So seeing bacteria actually in bronchoalveolar cells or doing a washing and having a bacteria grow from them is one of the ways to diagnose it. Um, the way to decrease the risk of VAP is wash your hands. Everyone uh, taking care of that patient. Keep the head of the bed up at 30 degrees or greater from horizontal. Um, in the past, GI acid suppression was something we did to try to prevent uh, ulcers, but um, if you do prophylactic GI acid suppression for everyone, it seems to increase the risk of VAP. And uh, the way I like to think of it is, well, if you reduce the acid, the bacteria can grow in there, and anything that you regurgitate and could go up and down in your trachea, the, there's no acid to kill those bacteria um, that could be in your stomach. So using GI acid suppression therapy only for high-risk patients is one way to decrease the risk. And then at the far right is showing a subglottic secretion drainage endotracheal tube. This is a special tube that has, um, in this case, showing subglottic secretions accumulating above the, the cuff, the balloon and there is a opening in that tube that allows you to connect to continuous suction or intermittent suction and remove those secretions so that over time they don't build up and potentially go past that cuff down into the lungs and be associated with uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. There's controversy over oral decontamination with chlorhexidine which some ICUs do. Diseases associated with difficult airway. Acromegaly was a key word from last year. Um, difficult intubation in about 20 to 30 percent of patients that are acromegalic or gigantism. Lots of growth hormone. Their tongue and epiglottis are enlarged from the stimulation from the growth hormone and they can have upper airway obstruction. They may be hoarse because of the thickened vocal cords. They may even have paralyzed vocal cords due to recurrent laryngeal nerve being stretched and they may have subglottic narrowing. So think, if someone has gigantism, acromegaly, very high chance of being difficult to intubate and potentially ventilate because of the tongue uh, swelling. Diabetes mellitus is also associated with a difficult airway because of decreased mobility of the atlanto-occipital joint. And one way to try to predict that is this prayer sign, which is shown at the far right. Prayer sign is associated with stiff joint syndrome and may predict a difficult direct laryngoscopy if you're unable to put your hands together like the picture on the left. The one on the right has um, the inability to do that and often because the joints are stiff there, there's likely stiff joints in the neck, uh, probably from glycosylation, having high sugars for a long period of time, of the uh, connective tissues and joints. So diabetes mellitus, difficult airway association. Rheumatoid arthritis, the cervical spine can be involved and possible instability at C1, C2, the atlantoaxial uh, uh, subluxation risk, and a lateral x-ray of the neck inflection can help diagnose that. Other uh, diseases or uh, situations associated with difficult airway include someone who's had radiation therapy to the neck, where their front of their neck, anterior portion of their neck, feels like what we call woody in duration, very tough. When you do DL in those patients, there's no place to put the tongue and the, no, the anterior space is not present and grade four views often can be uh, uh, on DL seen. So, uh, that is cervical spine fusion and some congenital diseases like Pierre Robin syndrome. Rheumatoid arthritis can affect the lung and the airway. We already talked about the cervical spine involvement, possible instability of C12, which is atlantoaxial subluxation, 
and a lateral x-ray of the neck in flexion can help diagnose that. But they can have a pleural effusions, lung nodules, pulmonary hypertension, and a restricted pulmonary function uh, test pattern. Restricted pattern, remembers, remember, is a decrease in both FEV1 and FVC, but a preservation of the ratio of FEV1 to FVC to greater than 80%. The next key word is myasthenia gravis, the respiratory effects, and uh, the most recent key word is postoperative ventilation of these patients with myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease, antibodies are formed against the postjunctional acetylcholine receptors. You have skeletal muscle weakness that is aggravated as you exercise, it gets worse. Often they are on cholinesterase inhibitors in attempt to raise acetylcholine levels. Pritostigmine is the classic one. If a patient is underdosed, they can be weak. Overdosed, they can go into cholinergic crisis. Um, and so there's a balancing act with this pyridostigmine. They're often on steroids, immunosuppressives in an attempt to reduce those antibodies, IV immunoglobulin, plasmapheresis, thymectomy is occasionally performed uh, when thymoma or the patient has early onset myasthenia gravis. Those are treatments. These patients tend to be sensitive to non-depolarizers. That is, you give them a little bit of rock uranium, one molecule, and they're paralyzed as opposed to succinylcholine. Succinylcholine needs enough receptors activated and open uh, to cause blockade, and they tend to be resistant to succinylcholine. The key word uh, most recently was in regards to postoperative ventilation and trying to predict which patients with myasthenia will require postoperative ventilation. There's some classic data that suggests that the longer you have the disease, more than six years, if you have comorb comorbid pulmonary disease, coexisting COPD, for example, or you're using really high doses of uh, pyridostigmine, the cholinesterase inhibitor, um, or your vital capacity is less than 2.9 liters. Other things like preoperative use of steroids in previous episodes of respiratory failure are things that would be predictive of a patient with myasthenia gravis undergoing surgery likely needing postoperative ventilation. Near drowning pathophysiology and treatment is the next keyword. If a patient um, um, it has a near drowning event, one of the things that you would be interested uh, in knowing is was the person in salt water or fresh water? Um, now, when they go into the water, sometimes they'll breath hold and laryngospasm or they can gasp and get fluid into the lungs. So sometimes there's just fluid in the oropharynx and larynx and nothing in the lungs if they laryngospasm or if they gasp, their lungs can be full of this water, which is either salt water or fresh water. In the case of salt water, it's hypertonic. If it's in the lungs, that hypertonic solution, it can draw fluid out of the bloodstream into the alveolus, into the lungs, and actually cause hypovolemia and hemoconcentration of the patient. Hematocrit rises. If it's a fresh water in the lungs, fresh water is hypotonic, and it leads uh, to absorption into the bloodstream. It hemodilutes the red blood cells. It can even cause lysis of red blood cells and can cause hypervolemia. So salt water, hypovolemia, fresh water, hypervolemia. If you witness a near drowning event or come upon someone who is in the water, uh, there is a difference in recommended CPR ACLS usually starts with chest compressions, but in this case, you do two rescue breaths first and then chest compressions uh, if they do not respond. And this is the differing from cardiac arrest due to other causes where CPR begins with immediate and uninterrupted chest compressions. Airway reactivity and upper respiratory tract infection is the next key word. Remember that the bronchial uh, hyperreactivity that can occur after having a virus, for example, uh, upper respiratory tract infection, you cough a lot, you got a little bit of mucus, and it goes on for weeks after you have a cold frequently. Well, this bronchial hyperactivity can occur up to six weeks or more following a URI, and this is often a problem in pediatric anesthesia populations like tonsillectomies, uh, where you have someone who has had a URI a couple weeks ago but keeps having them, and they need their tonsils out, and so you go, should I wait six weeks for uh, the uh, post-URI uh, 
hyperactivity to resolve, or should I do it because they're just going to get another URI? There's an increased perioperative risk in patients with recent URI to have laryngospasm, bronchospasm, coughing, and episodes of desaturation in the perioperative period, and predictors of having adverse rep respiratory events in a patient with URI if they're having concomitant airway surgery and a recent URI, if they have asthma and have lower respiratory tract signs like wheezing and it doesn't clear with a cough, they're exposed to passive smoke, their parents or others in the house are smoking, or they have purulent and productive secretions. If it was elective surgery and it was airway surgery and they were wheezing and they had purulent secretions, you might think about putting off that surgery for a period of time to resolve the bronchial hyperactivity. The uh, last key word is laryngospasm, pathophysiology, and management. The factors associated with laryngospasm include infants and children, more common, recent URI, reactive airway disease, exposure to secondhand smoke, airway surgery, lots of secretions, uh, putting things in the back of the throat like suction and endotracheal tubes in patients that are under light plane of anesthesia. There is complete laryngospasm which includes closure of the false vocal cords and apposition of the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis and interretinoids with absolutely no air movement. That is complete laryngospasm. That's where no matter what you do you are not able to get any air to pass. There is not even a squeak um, after complete laryngospasm. Larson's point is, is shown here in a picture uh, with the red arrow going to it. Larson's point, when you put pressure on that laryngospasm notch, it sometimes can break laryngospasm. So as you lift up in the jaw and press hard on Larson's point or laryngospasm notch, you hope that that laryngospasm will break. If there's a little bit of air movement or a partial laryngospasm, you should be deepening the anesthesia, and that's easy to do with a little bolus of propofol. If the laryngospasm is not breaking or there's complete laryngospasm, no air movement at all, patients becoming bradycardic, uh, neuromuscular blockade is indicated uh, with succinylcholine. Now, if you happen to have uh, reversed the patient already with neostigmine, let's say they had rock uronium block, you reversed them with neostigmine, you pulled the tube, and then they had a laryngospasm, and they had complete laryngospasm and you had to give them succinylcholine, you probably remember that succinylcholine and neostigmine can interact and you're going to have a probably a prolonged effect from that succinylcholine. If you have laryngospasm after sugamidex reversal, um, you can use succinylcholine unless there's some other contraindication, but if you needed to paralyze them with a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, you'd probably reach for a non-steroidal uh, like cisatricurium. So the graphic on the right shows uh, the management of laryngospasm. First of all, applying CPAP with 100% oxygen, uh, your airway maneuvers lifting up in the jaw, trying to see if, if air is moving. If it's complete laryngospasm without improvement, oftentimes succinylcholine is needed. However, if you have partial laryngospasm, you want to often deepen the anesthesia with propofol and reassess with a, some CPAP. Am I improving? Am I moving air? And often you will and not require administration of succinylcholine. So this is a five-part series. This is the fifth of that series covering all the keywords for about 12 years. And uh, we covered also the most recent ABA IT keywords, which are shown here. And I appreciate you viewing these, and I hope that you find them uh, a good learning experience. And I wish you the very best and hope you have a great day. These are pictures from the French Alps, September 2019, where I had the opportunity to ride for about 15 days, climbing over some of these mountains. And a couple days, we had snow up at the top, pretty cold, but a wonderful time. Good luck to you.